To all of our attendees, thank you for joining us today. We will begin with a welcome from Mitch Landrew, founder and president of E Pluribus Uno. Thank you all so much for joining us today. This week as Washington continues to debate what should be included in another round of COVID-19 stimulus, we're going to do a deeper dive on the economy. Today's conversation is the second in our partnership with the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. Our goal is to support local leaders that face a long road ahead in leading the economic recovery in their cities and towns resulting from the pandemic. Today, we look at the scope and the challenge of the unprecedented unemployment crisis that we're facing, as well as ways that local governments and NGOs can support job seekers in this pandemic-driven recession. We must also center policy solutions that address rising income inequality and increase access to economic opportunity. How do we transition those out of work into new quality jobs that will support them and their families? How can we learn from the innovative workforce programs already working in communities across the South? Before we begin today, I wanna to make two plugs. First, a key focus of our work at E Pluribus Unum is to support courageous leaders who are committed to strengthening their communities and are working in creative ways to address, address racial and economic equity in their communities. One way to do this is through our Unum Fellows Program, a leadership accelerator for Southern local officials. The application period for that program closes this Friday, July 31st. Second, tomorrow we continue our Truth Action Reconciliation Series with a look at the economic inequities and the origins of the racial wealth gap. We hope that you will join us. Now back to today. I wanna to thank our partners at Brookings. Today, we will hear from Annalise Goger, fellow of the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, Tamara Atkinson, Chief Executive Officer for Workforce Solutions for the Capital Area from Austin, Texas, Lauren King, Director for Workforce Programs from the Greater New Orleans Foundation, and Susanna Fritzberg, the Founding Executive Director of Birmingham Strong. Thank you all so much for being with us today and for joining us. And now I'll pass it over to you, Annalise. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone is hanging in there during this difficult time. I recently um, wrote an essay in Brookings um, COVID Metro Recovery Watch um, website, which collects a lot of our different research from Brookings Metro. And that piece focuses on what we're gonna do with this tidal wave of job seekers who are about to be starting to look pretty desperately for work. Um, you know, historically our workforce system is relatively under resourced compared to other countries. Um, we invest about one fifth of the average OECD country, meaning that if we were to invest at an average rate, we would have to spend another $86 billion helping people make labor market transitions. So in my essay, I lay out a plan, not only for funding uh, this work more, for helping people uh, find their way to a new career when they've been displaced, but also to think through how we can transform the system from a program mindset of transactional thinking of just finding something the next thing to a more systemic ecosystem where we have a number of partners that are working on different fronts to help um, get people equal access to information about jobs and careers, to help them access professional networks, and to help them really understand what their progression can be throughout a lifetime. So we're not thinking about learning and one and done. You go to college and that's the only option you have. But really, if, if we're really going to be a technological um, trend center into the future, we have to really invest in people all the way through their lifespan. This has been the 18th week in a row where we've had more people unemployed than uh, during the height of the Great Recession. We have 14 million more unemployed people than we have jobs right now. So this is not just a, a crisis of finding people uh, training, but actually it's also a, a crisis of demand. So we have to think about economic development. We can train all we want, but if there are no jobs to put people in, um, then it's not gonna work. So I think we need to be thinking in much more innovative uh, ways. And that's why I'm really glad to have the guests that we have here today. 
As part of our Metro Recovery Watch, we launched a series of case studies that I was involved in developing um, along with some of my colleagues. And we're gonna be adding to that set of case studies over time um, as, soon, as we encounter different practices that we're hearing about on the ground. So we encourage you to select uh, or to submit your case studies for us to review and consider for that uh, repository. And some of the spotlight efforts that we have on there for workforce include um, a platform called JobsGet that Mass Hire in central Massachusetts has partnered with to find people immediate jobs. Now, a lot of these jobs are not um, necessarily quality jobs that you wanna do in a lifetime, but if you're desperate to put on the food on the table, then that resource has seen a lot of, um, of increased demands uh, since this crisis started. And we wanna see how that could be a tool to expand on and build into it some quality jobs features into the future. Another tool that we highlighted is called My Plan in Sunnyvale, California. And that is um, an online resource that's really useful during this uh, particular situation where people are stuck at home, which basically walks you through what the phases of a job search are and connects people to different resources along the way, whether that's how do I do a resume, how do I network, and how do I negotiate an offer once I get a job. So um, those are just a few of the things we're trying to highlight. Um, one thing I want to talk about in particular, um, as we've had not just the pandemic, but it's been very clear, um, both from the killing of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, but also um, because of the way that this pandemic is having disproportionate impacts on people of color, especially black and brown communities. And I want to highlight a few things about um, what I think it will take to not have a racial neut race neutral or gender neutral approach to workforce development. So um, first and foremost, I think that um, we need to be intentional about it and we need to be able to measure and assess to what extent are we, are we um, anyone who's getting access to services in our job centers, which is a network of, of uh, resource rooms across the country where people can go to get assistance. How do we know um, who's, who is and is not getting access to those programs? We really don't know because currently we don't track everyone. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, um, we need affordable learning options throughout a lifetime that also has a clear progression. So you know that you can always come back for more and know what the next step is to advance. The th third thing is that we need to address social ex exclusion in labor markets and hiring practices of employers. If the major tech companies are only recruiting people from elite technical colleges, then that's not gonna include everyone in the local community um, that might be extremely talented, but they're not even looking at them. So how can we think through you know, those hiring practices and where talent is sourced from and unlock the potential in our local communities in addition to just recruiting from the same very small and privileged pool that tend to be um, filling those vacancies. Um, and then another aspect is childcare, transportation, mental health services, and all other kinds of support services that someone may need in order to be successful in a career, not just in getting any job, but really building a career and a sustainable lifestyle for themselves and their families. These are really critical services for someone to be able to A, complete a training program or go to college, and B, to be able to keep a job that, that they have. If they don't have childcare, especially in this pandemic, they aren't gonna be able to get um, a full-time job and, and leave their children at home. It just wouldn't make sense. Um, and then finally, career guidance and information is really vital. Not everyone has the same access to information. Most people get jobs through people they know. And that's how they also get information about jobs and careers. We have to really tackle head on who has access to what information about careers and job opportunities and how can we help um, specifically target folks that typically are left out of access to that information to help increase access uh, for talent that's out there um, seeking jobs right now. So with that, I wanna introduce our panel um, who will be sharing a lot about what they've been doing and how they've been thinking about this crisis, both in an immediate term and in the long term. We have, uh, we have Tamara Atkinson from the Austin, Texas area, Lauren King from New Orleans, and Susanna Fritzberg uh, from Birmingham. 
Um, so first I'll start with Tamara Atkinson, who's the CEO of Workforce Solutions in the Capital Area. And we're really excited to have her um, involved in our in board, our group of innovative networks. Um, sorry, I really butchered that one. <laughs> our innovative workforce board leader network um, that we run at Brookings Metro. Uh, so take it away, Tamara. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Annalise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's really an honor to be invited to speak with you. And Karen, thank you for uh, offering to run my deck for me. So uh, just a little bit of a context about Austin, Texas. So we are one of 28 workforce boards in the state of Texas. Um, I am the CEO of Workforce Solutions Capital Area and very proud to be working very closely uh, with our mayor and local government and the work that we do. One of the things to note and to build on what Annalise was just saying is workforce boards in the state of Texas manage subsidized childcare resources through the public workforce system. So as I go through my very brief deck with you today, please know that we do consider childcare as a critical support to helping our vulnerable individuals residents be able to reach their best job possible and we see the public workforce system as the mechanism to do that. Next slide please. Thank you Karen. So as we look at Austin, Texas, uh, what, what's happening in Austin? unlike the rest of the country, has really been experiencing unprecedented unemployment rates. Three times the pre-pandemic rate uh, is what we're seeing in our unemployment rate. Historically, Austin, Travis County have been uh, been tracking about two percentage points in an unemployment rate below the national and at least one below Texas's very strong historic unemployment rate. Prior to COVID, we had enjoyed 59 straight months of job growth in our region. However, we know and knew everyone in our community was able to benefit from Austin's strong economy and prosperity. Therefore, COVID has only shown a brighter light on, on inequities that we already had in our system that the public workforce system is now seeking to address. Next slide, please. So what has happened in the Austin context and what does the picture look like? And I promise uh, after bringing you down, I'm gonna bring you up with some good news here. But what we've seen in the last two months here in Austin, Texas, is that more people have filed for unemployment that in the, than in the Great Recession of 08 through 09. Uh, we've seen just an unprecedented, num unprecedented number of people. In June, in Austin alone, that was over 55,000 people uh, who were receiving jobless benefits. In our region, uh, nearly 99,000 people received benefits. Uh, we are fortunate as a workforce board in the state of Texas to have visibility into those who are receiving jobless benefits, UI benefits. So we are able to actually analyze that information. And some interesting trends that we're seeing um, is that the pandemic is disproportionately impacting those economically who were earning less even before COVID. One of the things that we've also seen is that last Great Recession, we had more individuals between the ages of 35 and 45 with plumb or greater who were receiving unemployment. This current situation in COVID is impacting younger individuals more in our region and those who, uh, who have only a high school diploma or GED. And they are, as you can see from my slides here, a great majority of them are coming from industry sectors that are not likely to recover quickly, if at all. Just a quick moment in time. Some of you may have heard of a little conference that Austin each spring called the South by Southwest Conference. That brings in over two million dollars in revenue in about a three-week period into our region, particularly in hospitality, restaurants, events. 
On March 6th of this year, Mayor Adler made the very difficult choice to cancel the South by Southwest Conference. And immediately, my phone started ringing from restaurant owners, managers, hotel managers, because they suddenly were in a crisis and thousands of people were impacted on that very weekend. And we have been very slow to see those jobs recover as COVID has persisted. Next slide, please. So then what, if, what has Workforce Solutions done in response? So we are very proud that we stake our claim on offering a person, a plan, and hope to everyone who reaches out to us at Workforce Solutions Capital Area. So what does that mean? That means that throughout this pandemic, we have really made a name providing individualized services to those who are in need. So we have really pivoted, while, while our offices are physically closed to most in the community, we have not stopped delivering services. And you can see here that we delivered personalized messages to thousands of individuals. Within a week of COVID hitting our community and within a week of South by Southwest being canceled, we were able to stand up what we call the Jobs Now website on our webpage that listed real-time job hirings and postings from employers that were actively ready to hire Austin Knights, put them back to work, and be able to help us all as a community survive through this pandemic. In addition to that, the Workforce Board has been able to bring together local resources we had in our budget and assistance from our state and federal workforce system to be able to bring needed resources to both businesses that were struggling, particularly small businesses, and to workers at the same time. And I'd like to note that as we look at recovering out of this, Annalise made reference to this, how do we look at where the future is going to go? One of the unintended, uh, and I hate to use that word, but what, what COVID has forced of our system is to look for a technology solution when people want us and a person when they really need to talk to someone. So what we are doing now is we are in the process of launching a technology-based solution that will have no more than 10 questions answer online, will curate for each job seeker what opportunities they can be matched to, and maybe significantly for long-term games, what job training program match, which are hybrid, offered in a hybrid model, which are offered online, and we will curate to-do lists in chunkable manners so that someone can digest it. And we will text and email these action plans to our, to our clients to see that they get the assistance they need. This will be a closed loop system that will also include access to support services. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here in addition to this technology to be developing? developing with our state agency, um, you know, what, what is our big, big picture? What is our moonshot for how we can recover both in Central Texas, across the state of Texas, and we think across the country? Well, we think the answer is 360 services provided to all of those who need them. If we want to see equitable, we want to come back better as a result of COVID and in our community. So in working very closely with our community-based organizations and our community college in Austin, Texas, we've built what we call a make it now uh, proposal. And it is the access for thousands of Central Texans to be able to ask for help and have their, their help individualized for them, be able to connect them rapidly to job training, including apprenticeship, including work-based learning, free or reduced tuition, access to a stipend to help people make ends meet, transportation, childcare, and of course, access to digital inclusion. We think this is key, but we're going to need some help and some advocacy from all of you on this call and others. For example, in Austin, Texas, the key funding source that I use, we use to meet needs in our is being reduced by 15% next year, even as I look to a 25 time 
increase in demand for my services, our services that we know are coming as a result of the $600 a week pandemic assistance that in Texas ended last weekend. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and this is, the, this is a slide I'm particularly proud of when we look at equitable outcomes. So at Workforce Solutions several years ago, we ask ourselves, how do we know if anyone is better off after receiving our services? Looking at our performance metrics through our contract were not enough. Our community deserved to know that people were better off. So we, so we looked in our data. We do have access to who receives our services. And while we still have a long way to go to build a more help build a more equ equitable community in Austin, Texas, we are proud that when we disaggregate our data, hold a mirror up to ourselves, we see that we are having an impact for communities, particularly communities of color, who have historically not all and always been able to benefit from is economic prosperity. I'll leave you with one last data point that's not on this slide, but since Annalise rec uh, referenced childcare, we also looked back during the same time period from 2016 to 18 to look at who received our childcare services were their income differentials. And we saw that within two years of receiving a subsidized child care support, a scholarship through our organization, families were earning on average $100 a year more per year after receiving that support in addition to other services. So the bottom line for me, supports matter, and the public workforce system can be an ally in helping move people out of poverty into better jobs in a more equitable way. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Tamara. A um, couple of things really struck, stuck out to me there because I've been looking at the earnings, uh, comparing different earnings of participants who exited the WIOA programs. And I found that black women on their annual equivalent wage is about $18,000 and Asian men have about $30,700. So there's a huge wage gap, earnings gap in the folks that are exiting from these programs. And the fact that you're able to equalize those, uh, I think is really notable. And the second thing that I found really striking is just that you're having a 15% cut at this time. And I think it really highlights the need for some funding um, to, to really buffer up some of these services. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker today. We're really pleased to have Lauren King, who's the director of the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Um, Lauren, uh, feel free to take it away. All righty, can you hear me okay? So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to uh, E Pluribus Unum and Brookings for inviting me to be part of this very, very important conversation. So I'm going to also go ahead and share my screen real quick with you all. Um, and I have a few slides that I would like to uh, reference while I'm speaking with you today. So um, just to get right into things here in New Orleans, um, the current workforce situation for us both in the state of Louisiana, as well as, as in the city of New Orleans is critical. Uh, the unemployment rate in the state is just under 10% and the city's unemployment rate um, being just above 16% uh, as of preliminary numbers for June. But when we apply a race and equity lens, those numbers increase exponentially. So for instance, the unemployment rate for African-American males prior to the pandemic vacillated between about 47% and 52%. Uh oh. I'm sorry, I had to stop there for a second. Uh, so it vacillated between 47% and 52%. But real time numbers right now are not available uh, regarding that actual um, demographic. However, based on national data, we know that African Americans are more likely to be uh, frontline workers and more likely to lose their jobs due to um, business closures. So what is the local impact of COVID-19 on the city's workforce? Well, 
to provide you with a more granular view, in May alone, the cities of New Orleans, Metairie, and Kenner combined reported having over 90,000 unemployment insurance claims filed. So if these numbers aren't staggering enough, um, I would like to highlight for you our hospitality industry. Uh, the city of New Orleans, of course, we pride ourselves on uh, playing host to millions of visitors annually. Um, prior to the pandemic, our hospitality sector employed over 80,000 New Orleanians. However, with restrictions uh, staying at phase two of the reopening, our local bars, uh, restaurants, hotels are being disproportionately impacted. Uh, the year-over-year -year change between April of uh, 2019 as compared to April of 2020 documents a 48.1% decline in employment in leisure and hospitality sectors. So to date, several of our bars, um, live music venues that have long standing um, within our communities have been forced and, and then have had to make the heart-wrenching decision to close their doors permanently. Uh, regarding our local hotels, um, based on the Louisiana Workforce Commission's report of um, worker adjustment and retraining notifications or WAR notices, um, estimates predict that more than 2,300 of our jobs are not likely to return in this year. So, as the Community Foundation for uh, Southeast Louisiana, the Greater New Orleans Foundation works to drive positive impact <clears throat> through philanthropy, leadership, and action in our region. And I think that we can all um, agree that given the current situation, there is such a great time and, and there's such a great need for action in this region. Um, the foundation has a history of being a relationship builder, a connector, an innovator, uh, particularly in this workforce space. So we first became involved in workforce development uh, through our New Orleans Works Initiative launched in 2011 with support from the National Fund for Workforce Solutions and the Social Innovation Fund. So now, as we refer to it, was created as a collaborative uh, partnership with partners including the City of New Orleans under the Landry Administration, uh, the United Way of Southeast Louisiana, the Kellogg Foundation, uh, the Ford and Cerna Foundations, uh, Baptist Community Ministries, Urban Strategies, and the J.P. Morgan and Chase. Uh, so Ganoff continues to serve as a backbone entity um, of this collaborative and connecting local employers, training providers, and community-based organizations uh, to create an innovative workforce solution. So these partnerships have essentially yielded over 500 residents receiving training. And we've also seen a 67% uh, promotion rate and uh, wage increase among program completers. So with an eye on um, assisting our hospitality workers to basically transition into quality jobs in other sectors, Ganoff has provided funding to um, Ashner Health System, which is the state's largest employer, uh, in partnership with the uh, New Orleans uh, Career Center to support a newly created four-week online um, patient care technician program. Similarly, we have provided funding to LCMC, another one of the state's larger health systems, to support its partnership with Delgado Community College uh, in their PCT program. We've also supported uh, the Institute for Community Health Workers at LSU. So all three of these programs are targeted to, um, towards unemployed hospitality workers, as well as our hospitality, I mean, our opportunity youth ages 18 to 24, um, while providing immediate access to jobs with a career pathway. And so in addition to these programs, the foundation has also worked very closely with CORE to provide targeted testing uh, for our hospitality workers and their families in service to amplifying worker protection while instilling consumer confidence in our local eateries. So I will say 
based on lessons learned from uh, our workforce, uh, our work in, in healthcare, uh, the foundation has found that primarily these jobs are attracting uh, African American females. So prior to the pandemic, the foundation began exploring uh, sectors outside of healthcare to better target African American and Latino males. So one area of focus is the uh, emerging green infrastructure sector. And of course, green infrastructure, it includes trench digging and construction of um, rain gardens and bioswells. So in partnership with the, um, the Water Environmental Federation, one of the outcomes of this work is to uh, develop an entry-level green infrastructure curriculum that is currently being vetted by our local employers to ensure that skills being trained align with actual skills needed. So I think we can all agree that the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified the, uh, the improprieties oh, in, uh, in so many of our systems, improprieties in so many of our systems. I can't get the word out today. But to borrow from the Biden campaign, um, this pandemic is also allowing us to examine our systems in an effort to build back better. So the success that we've seen uh, from the programs that the foundation has supported are those that provide, again, as Annalise has already uh, mentioned, supportive services such as childcare, uh, transportation, stipends. And I'd also flag for you the importance of providing, um, again, opportunities for mental health as well as financial literacy. Um, these, these additional supports are clearly needed as, um, in, in, in inclusion as we work towards building a better workforce system. So anecdotally, we must also look to supporting policies, of course, that um, provide paid time off and that, um, you know, again, create and, and, in, um, and support increases in minimum wage. You know, all of us have heard that uh, the enhanced unemployment insurance really has led to uh, workers um, not desiring to return to work because they were actually, um, actually earning more on unemployment than they had ever made. So this really just underscores the need to have um, better pay, particularly for our hospitality workers. And so on a final note, I'll leave you with um, the digital divide. The digital divide is real. Many of our families um, and individuals are really being left behind due to uh, a lack of access to broadband. And this is really being exacerbated as individuals are needing to access employment and uh, training opportunities online. So as we figure out what our new normal is going to look like, it is imperative that we consider um, how all of these elements will work together either for or against our most marginalized communities. So thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Lauren. That was really interesting. I'm, and I think, you know, I'm, I think it's really fascinating about the green jobs program that you're doing and especially the focus on digital, uh, digital divide, not just for broadband, but also for digital literacy and access to devices, which we've seen a lot in a discussion around the uh, opening schools debate around um, the need for digital equity. But this is true also for anyone looking for work that if you don't actually have access to uh, a device and the connection and the ability to use it, then it really puts you at a disadvantage right now for a job search. Um, so I really appreciate your comments. So the third person that we're going to have speak today is Susanna Fritzberg from Birmingham uh, Strong, and she's going to share a little bit about some of the work they're doing there. Thank you so much, Annalise. Um, and thank you, Mayor Landrew, the E Pluribus Unum team, um, and Brookings for the opportunity to talk to you today. Excuse me, let me just get this presentation started. Um, my name is Susanna Fritzberg, and I am the executive director of Birmingham Strong, which is a public-private partnership formed to strengthen Birmingham's COVID-19 response and build economic resilience for the future. 
So in contrast to some of uh, my fellow presenters today, we are a brand new organization. Um, we're, we're really in startup mode and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to continue and grow and strengthen our model. Um, and I'm appreciative of so many of the interesting things that we've heard already and have had the opportunity to learn from. I'm going to talk mostly today about something called the Birmingham Service Corps, which is a joint initiative between Birmingham Strong and the city of Birmingham, um, led by Mayor Randall Woodfin, which focuses on employing un- and underemployed workers in the Birmingham area to meet emerging needs in the midst of the COVID pandemic. As I know everyone on on this call is aware COVID is a public health crisis and it's also an economic crisis um, driven by the, the fact that our public health response has not been strong and robust in the way that it needed to be. And it's an economic crisis that is really running along fault lines of inequality and precarity that existed for a long time in cities like Birmingham. We're the fourth largest majority black city in the country and our residents are especially vulnerable to the public health and the economic effects of COVID-19. And we know that the workers who have lost their jobs, who are concentrated in our non-tradable sectors, which are a large portion of our local economy, um, are uniquely disadvantaged um, in terms of their access to savings and the skill sets that they can leverage in seeking jobs in the future. In addition to unemployment generally, our residents have specific vital needs um, and COVID-19 has really sharpened the urgency to meet those. So things from food insecurity to, you know, as mentioned was in a previous presentation, access to internet and broadband services, transportation, any number of issues that are exacerbated by the fact that pre-pandemic 40% of our families with children lived under the poverty line. And um, we're, we're now seeing as, as greater and greater needs and they're unevenly met across our community. So the city of Birmingham, as the COVID pandemic really started to take root locally, faced three major challenges. One is this, um, the, the fact that Birmingham residents needed support to meet vital needs. Two is a need for workers to be empowered to participate in a re resilient economy, an inclusive economy that can overcome COVID and then um, has a, a path to thrive in the future. And the third thing, frankly, is that our local institutions, specifically our city, needed an agile partner that was laser focused on COVID relief and recovery and that could move more quickly um, than the city itself was able to. So BHAM Strong was founded as a public-private partnership by the city of Birmingham and a coalition of local partners to strengthen our COVID response and build economic resilience for the future. We work hand in glove with the city. They're our major funder, um, providing uh, about two thirds of our funding through uh, what they believe to be CARES Act reimb reimbursable funds, um, as well as partnerships with our local nonprofit sector um, and, and some for-profit organizations as well. Our flagship program, and the one that I'm really excited to talk about today, is the Birmingham Service Corps, which we launched in partnership with the city of Birmingham in May. Uh, as a way to leverage one of those challenges I mentioned, really, you know, very, very high unemployment rates that were disproportionately targeted towards our most vulnerable residents against another challenge, which is the evolving and rising community needs that our local institutions weren't necessarily prepared or had the ability to kind of quickly pivot to address. So we built the service core really on the model of Great Depression era work relief programs like the WPA or the CCC. And our goal is to connect out of work residents to paid volunteer opportunities that meet these needs. Um, anyone can apply for membership, qualify that they're a member of the Birmingham community, age 18 or older. Our average age um, of folks that we place ends up being at about 32. We select people for membership based on their skill set for our projects, um, our values of equity and diversity, and our commitment to public health basic needs provision and economic stabilization. And just to illustrate a few of the projects that we've worked on, um, 
I, uh, either, there's a real range here and it sounds like um, Kendra Key from, from Hope may have been on one of these calls previously, so you guys are familiar with their model. We work to staff um, a local credit union to ensure that particularly some of our African American owned and led small businesses businesses were supported in access to SBA funding. We've also supported, you know, the creation of personal protective equipment, staffed and set up testing sites, focused on school supply distribution. Um, and then there's a range of nonprofit placements that are prioritizing, you know, longer term projects that build some skills for our clients in client services, um, for our members, excuse me, in client services, administration, and data management by doing a six to eight week placement with a, a host nonprofit that is themselves providing direct COVID relief. So our model is really built on kind of the, the philosophy and premise of earn and learn, which I know has a very specific meaning in, in the workforce development ecosystem. Um, but the idea that, that we get income to residents immediately as they become members of the service corps, as they're staffed on these projects and they work towards building skills is a critical part of the fact that this is not just about, you know, having um, folks to, to address some of these challenges, but recognizing that we're um, at a place of unique economic precarity for, for many of our members. We've placed about 325 individuals into paid work opportunities across the city. Um, and we're pleased that 67% uh, of those members are people of color, about 63% are black. Um, our demographics of the city were about 75% black. On average, members of the service corps have experienced a 50% decrease in their income as a result of COVID-19. And 90% of those that we've surveyed say that income earned through Birmingham Strong through the Service Corps has gone to support their basic needs, food, rent, utilities, other critical expenses. We've also assisted you know, nearly 3,000 small businesses through a combination of technical assistance um, and work looping them in with, with SBA funding. And really we've served uh, residents across the city with the, the projects that we've placed individuals on. We pay uh, between 16 and $22 an hour. Again, really important for us that that's um, actually slightly above the, the living wage rate locally. Um, again, our focus is, is not only on you know, these particular work projects, but making sure that we're investing in um, the individuals that, that are serving in, in the core. And the Service Corps obviously began as a pandemic release relief initiative, both for the core members and for the community that are serving. Um, but I think as, as we're all aware, um, as COVID cases climb, as they're doing in Alabama, um, pandemic relief is going to continue to be a really important part of our core mission. At the same time, though, we're you know, seeing it as increasingly essential to lay the groundwork for long-term recovery, particularly in cities like Birmingham that have been so hard hit. We know that COVID has changed our local economy. Our new job postings are down by nearly 50%. Um, service and our other non-tradable sectors have been particularly hard hit. Some of this is reinforcing what we knew already around the vulnerability of, of non-tradable sectors in the context of recession. And really what we're seeing is that this is part of a larger economic shift where in many ways COVID is accelerating the anticipated impact of automation on our local, um, our local economy and in our local workforce. And just to, to illustrate, you know, one particular uh, fact that, that is, hits home because especially many of the individuals that we work with on the service corps um, hold a high school diploma or, or less, um, we stand to lose about 14,000 net jobs uh, by fourth quarter 2024. Those 14,000 jobs that aren't coming back and that is going to require a strategy not only to reskill individuals, but to Annalise's point at the beginning of the call, really sustained economic development efforts to ensure that we're growing opportunities on a local state and national level to, to get folks back to work. A ray of light for us here is that new industries are developing in Birmingham, um, and especially around the University of Alabama at Birmingham um, Medical Center and investments in genomics and precision population medicine. We're seeing the opportunity for new job categories and opportunities here locally with the capacity to, to add demand across the state. And 
it's our strong belief that skills acquired in the service core in the pandemic model, as we think more about, you know, opportunities to, to upskill individuals, those can be the foundation for career trajectories in the industries that we see increased demand. And particularly, it's our belief that funding opportunities in the CARES Act create an opportunity to address emerging needs in the way that we've done it, to leverage existing evidence-based programs and partnerships to design learning opportunities and really to build a workforce strategy um, around emerging industries like precision population health. To do that, um, you know, I think our model will adapt and evolve. As I mentioned right now, we're really focused on, you know, our version of, of pandemic style earn and learn workforce development rooted in employer partnerships um, and targeted towards the areas of greatest need in our community. As, as we and our partners at the city look to the future, I think there's opportunities to adapt our model um, to be focused on sectoral workforce development, um, to think about leveraging competency-based credentials um, as a way to take our members who largely you know, don't, don't hold advanced degrees um, uh, to, to bring those folks into the continuum of, of pathways to good jobs. And then uh, to ensure that we're being really alive to the fact that supportive services, whether it's transportation, childcare, ability to pay rent, are a crucial part of enabling people to succeed in training opportunities and, and eventually in job placement. So I'll just close by saying, I think in, in the context of Be Hem Strong as a COVID response organization that is really built to leverage CARES funding, the, the fundamental challenge that we see and that the city of Birmingham has asked us to respond to is to deploy resources quickly in order to you know, place and when possible upskill displaced or vulnerable work, workers. And to think about doing that in a way that's focused on good jobs linked to career pathways in growth industries. We don't see that really our, our workforce and economy needs are um, wildly different in the context of COVID. We see that the scale of the challenge, the urgency of responding and, and the resources available absolutely have. So it's our belief that models like the Birmingham Service Corps can be part of solving this challenge in the future, um, obviously dependent on a lot of other actors at, at the state and federal level. Um, but I'm excited by the chance to share a bit about our model um, and, and to learn from all of the others who have presented. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that. I did want to uh, flag for everyone. Uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you scroll down and we would welcome your questions. Um, we'll start taking questions in a few minutes, um, but I'd like to ask all of the presenters to turn on their videos. And um, I'd like to start with a question, which is, you know, we, a lot of people have talked about funding constraints and what you're doing to leverage existing resources and then this huge demand on this other side. Um, what could be done at the federal, state, and local levels to scale, you know, some of these uh, more innovative practices. It seems to me that the what's innovative about them is they involve partnerships, they involve wraparound services, not just one element, like just a training program, but training plus childcare. Um, they involve these different coordinated efforts and what could be done um, at those different levels to scale them? Well, I can jump in there first, if that's all right. And I'll, I'll say that um, I think in, in Austin, Texas, we've got a model that we've had in place for a number of years, Annalise, to do exactly that. Um, I think it is, I think the public workforce system is an under-recognized, sometimes undervalued mechanism uh, that can bring together not only the partners that can do the work, but the critical support services and then be able to measure the outcomes. So I think it is the wraparound services. I think it's meeting people where they are. I think it is recognizing in the current environment and for the foreseeable future, people need access to both supports, money in their hands to be able to pay their bills and also options that allow them to learn safely at home and offer them a variety of various earnings that allow them to continue to grow their skills through public private partnerships with businesses. So uh, I feel that there are models. I think the, the my fellow presenters have also provided some amazing examples. But bottom line for me is we've got to recognize workforce development, job training, job management, 
critical part of our infrastructure building. We can, we should address, need to address the pandemic as a health crisis, but we will all as a country languish if we don't recognize job, job matching, helping people get into better jobs is critical to infrastructure building. I'll step in quickly. Um, I think one thing that would fundamentally change the landscape for, for us and for programs like us is leveraging state unemployment systems to expand opportunity for, for people to work and also be a part of training um, during this, this period. You know, we, we've seen that every state operates unemployment a little bit differently, and obviously that's caused a lot of consternation in the, in the way that federal benefits have flowed. But um, certain programs like WorkShare, for, for example, um, are you know, actually only active in a few states, and in those states where they exist, um, there's really, really low numbers of firm uptake there. Um, so you know that that takes a coordinated effort, I think, at the federal level, and then among private private employers to kind of um, in investigate and uh, and opt into the workshare model. But that's something that I think could be really transformative in order to scale some of these opportunities to to earn and learn in the midst here. And I guess, and I'll just add to that, some of the things that we're seeing uh, in in the city. Um, is actually the mayor's support of workforce development or working committees. And so what that working committee is tasked with doing is identifying uh, transferable skills for individuals, particularly in the hospitality industry for uh, our two other sectors. So we're really trying to maybe look at diversification uh, in some respect so that because we know a lot of our hospitality jobs are not going to be coming back within this year and we really don't know how soon they will be coming back so we have to focus on making sure that our um, our workforce is employable and that they have opportunities so just underscoring um, being able to identify those jobs that are currently available that don't need um, a long a, a long array of training but we'll be able to easily transition our health, uh, our uh, hospitality folks into those uh, sectors as well. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I want to pass the mic to Roxanne Franklin Lorio, who's going to join our conversation. Uh, to, she's the managing director of programs at E Pluribus Unum. Um, and I wanted to see if she had any questions for the panelists today. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been a fantastic, insightful, and actionable conversation. Um, we have a couple questions here, and um, so I will read them to you. And please, any of you, just take, um, take them as they come. So one of the conversations that we've been having today is around public-private partnerships, um, states and local government working with private investment. And so how can can you talk a little bit about the ways that state and local governments can incentivize more private investment in workforce systems and, and work effectively with the private sector to advance this kind of um, economic equity um, in communities? Does anyone want to take that question? <laughs> I'll talk. I'll take it if no one else will. I mean, so I think that one thing that states need to do more of is incentivizing companies to train and, and to hire from new pipelines. Um, so one way that they're doing that in California, I did a study recently before I came to Brookings at Social Policy Research Associates with the California Employment Training Panel, and they reimburse employers for training. And in our study, we found that especially for, for employers of a size over 18 and under 100, they had very positive impacts on the company revenues, but also on um, employment at that company. So they, it incentivized not just the company to, to earn more, but also to hire more. And so training uh, is great for, you know, preventing um, people's skills from getting old and keeping people's skills fresh. So when there are new technologies, you can deploy them. And I think there's a, it's an underutilized tool to really promote a culture of learning within a company. So a lot of the employers we interviewed for that study said that, um, you know, having that extra money from the state helped them build their internal pathways and internal advancement strategies within the company. So it added to their existing capacity, allowed them to formalize programs that used to be more informal. And if we're talking about equity and diversity, I think 
it's really in essential for employers to, to play a higher, a more of a role in providing those opportunities for advancement within their firms. And so I think states have a role that they can play in helping to push firms to do that. I'd like I to also, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, let me, I uh, just wanted to add to that as well. Um, opportunities for um, making it easier for employers to access, you know, the different resources. So I know that a case in point was uh, when I worked with Delgado Community College and we worked with customized training applications. There were times when the, the, the process itself was very cumbersome. So if there's a way for us to look at um, possibilities of uh, streamlining, that in fast tracking uh, those processes, I think that that would really be very uh, beneficial to our employers and it would encourage them to take advantage of some of the resources that are already available. Two quick examples from Austin. One is last year, our local government, City of Austin, overhauled their economic development incentive program and they put the public workforce system at, as the hub, direct companies to us that when they wanna hire, reach economic incentive goals. They work through the public workforce system that allows them and us to ensure equitable employment across our community. So bringing us to the table early. Similarly, last week, Tesla announced the creation of a gigafactory in Austin, Texas, and public workforce system brought to the table early as part of that public-private partnership to serve as that hub to see that all residents of our community can so my answer would be private partnerships work when you recognize the public workforce system as a value-added hub. Thank you so much. Um, and just an additional question around public workforce systems. Have any of you um, experienced using and implementing the earn and learn using WIOA funds in, during this time? Um, and if so, can you share how that has, um, how that has come together? Okay. If no one has, um, I've studied WIOA pretty carefully and I can probably explain why. <laughs> um, so the way that performance is assessed under WIOA is, is based on your second, your, your, inner, your placement after the second quarter when you exit the program and your fourth quarter of retention. So you're talking about up to a year after you exit the program and when you're doing a real, like a real apprenticeship program, a registered apprenticeship, for example, that, that can take three or four years. And, and the way that, employ, and that things work in WIO is that when someone is enrolled, they're cons consistently getting that supportive service, the, the constant um, you know, attention from a case manager. It is a really long period uh, to sustain that high level of engagement. And um, not to say it shouldn't happen, but that's a very expensive proposition, right? So like if, if resources are limited, you can't really engage for that long with someone on a sustained basis. Um, and so I think there's a combination of like if someone is in a print apprenticeship and earning money, you can't exit them because they're not in a job yet, right? So they're staying in your system for a really long time. A lot of people uh, who earn lower wages don't persist in those apprenticeships as well. So that's another challenge is that people are concerned that um, they may not want to take a risk by enrolling someone in an apprenticeship because uh, if they have other needs and that they're not being met, um, again, they might not stay in that apprenticeship. So um, there's the, the timing, the performance measurement and the funding levels don't really fit that earn and learn model very well. And, um, and the training that is typically provided under uh, Earn and Learn is done in a classroom. It's usually done in a public community college or a regional public university. Um, and those are, you know, they don't fit the right, uh, they don't fit that model either. <laughs> so there's a lot of like polit political policy uh, details that need to be sorted out to make sure that those are more amenable to the model that for public funding. Thank you so much. So we have quickly come to the end of our time here today. And I would like to thank our panelists so much for sharing about all the hard work you are doing in the communities that you serve in Austin, New Orleans, and Birmingham. We would also like to thank our partners at the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. And we'd also like to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. Thank you.